Welcome to the Making Data Human Virtual Forum, where experts on data from a cross-section of industries will be discussing the intersection of data and intuition. Today's panel is moderated by Chitra Nabat. Chitra Nabat is a contributing host of the Harvard Business School Skydeck Alumni Podcast. She was also the New York-based anchor for Reuters International TV. Chitra is a requested speaker and moderator at forums such as the Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce, Harvard Business School, and numerous Wall Street industry and investor conferences. Chitra, take it away. Hi, welcome to the Making Data Human Virtual Forum. My name is Chitra Nava, and I'm the moderator for the first part of this forum. This conversation about making data human is extremely important and timely. Industries are being transformed by data. Our world is being transformed, but many key decision makers still lack understanding about how these technologies work, how they can help improve the human decision-making process and what they can do for humanity and their specific businesses. Data scientists haven't done a great job explaining these new technologies and bringing life into data, but this is all starting to change. Today, I'm very excited to be sitting down with the CEO of a company that's infusing life into data, making data dance, Irfan Khan. Irfan is an innovator and angel investor recognized for building customer-centric organizations and driving business transformation. After successfully building a leading supply chain company within a $21 billion conglomerate, Irfan has decided to take on a new challenge at the forefront of the data revolution as CEO and president at Cloud Sufi a company that claims to bridge the gap between data and human intuition. Irfan has previously held leadership roles at Bristlecone, Microsoft, and Hughes Software, where he successfully led organizational changes and process improvement in markets across the Americas, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Irfan, welcome. Good morning, Chitra. How are you doing? Let's dive into this conversation. You're leading an innovative company that is helping organizations build solutions to maximize the potential of their data but you haven't always been in the data sphere. Tell us a bit about your background and why you became interested in this problem of data. Chitra, I spent the last two decades building anti-fragile supply chain for global customers. Now we all know that a supply chain is the backbone of every organization. It's actually the soul on which the organization dances. However, in these two decades, I also realized that supply chain and organization needs a lot more visibility to flourish. And this visibility is something that needs to be created after looking not only at enterprise data, but also structured and unstructured data. So I knew it was now time for me to step up the game. You talk about data and you've got supply chain, and then there's this notion of data supply chain, right? So if you could talk about that and why it's such a challenge for organizations to get this right. The journey of data from bytes to insight is an amazing metamorphosis. And this is what I call the data supply chain. The business really have to visualize it, right? This leads to a conclusion on how a set of problem can be solved or a new opportunity uncovered. This is complex and it's really important to get it right. Look at the complexity, right? From data connectors to pipelines, data lakes to data models or statistical models, AI to quantum, visual storyboard to data-driven automation. This is all what we do for customers to make sure their data starts dancing. Cloud Sufi has deep expertise in the healthcare space. The applications of data in healthcare are very exciting and timely in the wake of COVID-19. How can data improve patient outcomes and care? That's a very pertinent question, Chitra. The amount of data collected and analyzed by hospitals and the healthcare organizations across the world is crazy. The global pandemic has sharpened the focus on data analytics, all of them, whether it's descriptive, predictive, and cognitive. It becomes core to the way they're looking at scenarios around them. At the same time, then there's the decision makers, they have to assimilate new research funding, adjust the policies, and do it in all in real time just to make sure they're able to save time. Time is of the essence right now, right? They want to save time, and every second they save, they're saving a life. No one knows what the new normal is going to look like. However, we know it is a black swan event. The disruption has already happened. Data and analytics will be the core to new normal. Irfan, it was really interesting sitting down with you today and learning about your work with Cloud Sufi. 
Uh, in our next segment, Irfan, you'll be sitting down with three fantastic panelists to dissect how data has impacted their respective industries. Uh, let's uh, introduce uh, and welcome our panelists. Our first is uh, Benny Pugh. He's made significant contributions to the entertainment industry uh, through executive positions at powerhouse labels from Motown Records and Def Jam to Epic Records and Rock Nation. Uh, Pugh is now blazing his own trail as an entrepreneur. Prior to Diverse Media, Benny was the president of Rock Nation Music and served as executive vice, vice president of Epic Records, a division of Sony Music Entertainment. Benny has previously overseen the label's promotion and marketing strategies as executive vice president of Urban Music and is credited with leading Epic's urban team to great success, including becoming the number one urban record label of the year in 2017. Before that, Benny was Senior Vice President of Production at Universal Music Group's Island Def Jam, where he helped propel Rihanna and Kanye West to superstardom, among many others. Benny is currently writing his first book on impact, which will come out in the summer of next year. Benny, welcome. Thank you, Citra. Tony Siva is a world-renowned thought leader, author, speaker, educator, angel investor, and Silicon Valley entrepreneur. He's the author of the number one Amazon best-selling book, Clean Disruption of Energy and Transportation, Solar Trillions, and Winners Take All, and co-author of Rethinking Transportation, 2020 to 2030, Rethinking Food and Agriculture, 2020 to 2030, and Rethinking Humanity, Five Foundational Sector Disruptions, The Life Cycle of Civilizations, and The Coming Age of Freedom. His work focuses on technology disruption, the convergence of technologies, business model innovation, organizational capabilities, and product innovation that leads to the creation of new industries and societies and the collapse of existing ones. Tony, welcome and thank you for being a part of this forum. Thank you, Chitra. Lori Shearer is a partner in Bain & Company and she's a recognized expert in the art and science of applying advanced analytics to business problems. Lori has successfully launched several significant analytics businesses she leads world-class analytic, R&D, and client delivery teams. Lori is the architect of the strategy for new decision support solutions across a broad range of applications, including marketing, risk, operations, and portfolio management. Lori is also a published author and speaker at industry forums and events. Lori, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chitra. It's a pleasure to be here. Irfan, now I hand it over to you. Thank you, Chitra, and uh, uh, stay safe, right, uh, to all of us because of the interesting times. Uh, welcome to making uh, Data Human Forum. This is really exciting. I have uh, people on the panel. I have Benny from the music world. I have uh, Sherry from the analytical world. And then I have uh, my friend, Tony, uh, who, uh, you know, we spend uh, a lot of time taking walks in San Francisco and discussing, and I'm like a curious child asking Tony, what's going to happen next? So he predicts the disruption. And so far, you're pretty bang on in everything what you've said. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, uh, to be here taking some of the experts spiriting the revolution of their respective industries. As you know, data is changing every aspect of our life, uh, from healthcare to communication to our careers and even how we shop, right? but it remains a black box for many people. I've had this conversation with so many people in, in my sphere, whether we are, are my customers, uh, people I coach, people, companies I invest, employees in Get Cloud Sufi. And that's what really inspired me to host this uh, panel because the real power of data is how we can use data to augment human decision-making process. As humans, we've always looked at data to validate our gut and disapprove it and give them new insights. As a kid, I mean, as you, as you grow older, you've realized that, oh, you know what? My gut told me this. Damn it, I should have done that. And then I, I either looked at an analysis report or I've looked at, talked to somebody and they give them these logical data and I made a decision. And it, I've, in my gut, I always felt that I should have not taken it and I took it, right? And as you get a little bit more wiser and it's a function of the time you spend, you realize that, you know, your gut is right. We're trying to just really make sure that can we bring this, reduce this gap? Can you make uh, uh, the data really human for us to do that? And uh, we're looking for numbers to tell a story about reality. 
and give us actionable steps on how to behave more optimally. And that's what my passion is. And that's what I have a, a common thread amongst all of us, which brings us together to talk about uh, what can we share with the audience to talk about how can we uh, make the data human. So let me uh, start by having you all introduce yourself, which Chitra did a bit of it, but I would love to uh, you to share something which people don't know about you, right? And, uh, and talk a little bit about how data has impacted your industries and lives over the last five to 10 years. So let's go with uh, Laurie yourself first. Sure. Thanks, Irfan. Um, well, so I don't know if there's much that you don't know about my career in analytics. We've spent quite a lot of time together. But one thing I'd like to highlight for this forum is, um, and I say this frequently when I speak, is that analytics is not really new. You know, Irfan, that I spent seven years of my career at FICO, the company that invented the credit score. The credit score was invented, the first one was launched in 1958. So it's been quite a long history of using data and analytics to make credit decisions. And that innovation actually had quite, quite a societal impact because lending, consumer lending up until that point had been highly, highly subjective. So what kind of car you drove, what you know, what kind of uh, clothing that you wore into the local bank, <clears throat> your zip code where you lived, all uh, had an impact on whether or not <clears throat> you would receive credit and at what rate. And the credit score really um, democratized that because the credit score is regulated and it cannot take into account um, anything that could be considered discriminatory. So at the advent of the credit score, that was really a big social breakthrough in making lending objective and not subjective. So that's one way in which analytics has had a big impact, I think, on our society. Uh, Laurie, what problems are business looking to fix when they come to you? And uh, how will they understand the power of their own data? That's a great question. So um, at Bain, we serve companies um, in both incumbent industries as well as disruptors. But more, more often, the, the incumbents come to us. And they are, they're being disrupted across banking, financial services, healthcare, et cetera. They're seeing upstarts that are digital native, that have access to the data that they're creating, the digital exhaust that they create on their websites and so on. And so the incumbents in these industries are realizing that the power of data in making more precise decisions, more objective decisions, more efficient decisions. So these companies come to us and they're sitting on massive amounts of data, but that data is all in silos in the systems um, that they, they are generated by. And they have lots of challenges in getting that data into a usable format so that they can start to do analytics. So that's one, one part of the challenge that they face. The other is attracting the right talent and building analytic teams and um, hiring data scientists who can wrangle the data uh, and actually apply it to, to business problems. So generally that's what we do is, is help companies build the capability to use and harness the power of data. To be honest, I'm always curious, infatuated, uh, in love with, and if I was not doing this, uh, Benny, I would be in your industry, that's for sure. Uh, Benny, tell us something uh, to the audience which people don't know about Benny, number one. Nobody knows it. And uh, second is, uh, in this industry, is there a place for analytics coming in? It's a, it's a, is there a place for data coming in right now? So um, a fun fact that very few people know, um, I'm a failed comedian, is actually how I fell into music, right? Um, so arts is where I've always lived as a child, but um, my first in, uh, introduction to music was actually through comedy. So that's something now the world knows. Um, what's so exciting now about the music business and just thinking about, you know, all of the innovations, which music has been on the cusp of, of, um, you know, the forefront of, of a lot of creations, right? Especially in the arts, but also in business. What technology has done is help enhance the business of the music business, right? As you opened and talked about gut, a lot was relied on gut, right? If, um, uh, it was all left in the hands of of the executives at the record companies or touring agents, right? And and determining the factors of of picking artists and picking stars, and uh, associated with each and every one of those those choices is an economic uh, impact, right? And what what uh, what technology has done is it's giving you a better opportunity um, to hedge your bet in the business 
um, of music, but also what it's done, the algorithm piece of it is, is now allowed us to, as consumers, uh, our listening habits, right? Like now, if you're in your house playing Stevie Wonder's song to the key of life 700 million times over and over and over and over, there's no way for me to know that, right? And there's no other data that can support that. But now if you go to Spotify and, and you choose that, right? It now impacts my listening and, and the experience of choices that are given to me. So now I can experience based on your habits, things that we have similar and that we, in, we enjoy together. So it's a better fan experience um, for, for the, you, the end user as, as you uh, maneuver through the 60,000 a day uploads that Spotify receives, right? So it now helps narrow down the focus of, of what you enjoy as a consumer, as well as target for the artist, a specific kind of um, audience as well. Um, but I think the human factor is always going to be important in music, right? Because there are certain things, although the algorithms can put you in a direction, um, necessarily humans can always create what's most viable about the art, right? Like if you think about um, the power of what music does and affects us, right? It does, it helps us in like our important decisions. There might be a song that you associate with, right? Inspiration, there may be a song that you associate with. Your first kiss, you know, war and peace, right? Those are the things that algorithms can't do. So there's a necessary balance in both. Oh, that's uh, Benny. That's wonderful what you just said. But I, I'm, I'm, there's another question which comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. Do you see that challenge that if I'm an artist and I my my intuition, my gut, my soul says something, a song, are you uh, do you see a big sometimes a face off by the analysts saying, oh no, analytic guys were saying, oh this is not going to work. There's no audience for it. You need to choke your 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 music or you need to tweak your music to a point where it fits. So if, do you see this? Uh, kind of uh, 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 to, to the head-on collision sometimes where which could choke an artist saying that, no, this is not what you're supposed to sing or tweak that singing because, uh, and that kind of takes the creativity away or it enhances it. I would love to hear uh, your experience on that. Well, uh, <clears throat> they run parallel, right? And it just depends on what business you're running from a commerce perspective, right? There are wins in both that you can point to. People who knew that this was the song, right? And they were right, right? With all of the down pressure that was surrounding them. I've made those choices in my career. And then there are opportunities like Little Nas X, who's had one of the biggest records of, you know, of, of, this, of this generation and decade, right? Was simply by um, uh, the, the effects of, of um, an algorithm and, and no one saw it coming. So in essence, you know, music works in that space. It's not, you can't define it and you can't define the choices, right? But what you can do is, is, is pick which, which path you choose to go down, as well as you can use a balance. Some things, as long as you have the information and that's where the data is important. If the data is leading you one way, right? But your gut is telling you something, but your ratio on gut versus data, right? then that's where the executive piece actually comes in. People are paid to make those choices. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Tony, uh, again, uh, this is the question uh, I've, uh, I've always asked you during our famous walks in San Francisco. Uh, but before I go to that question, <clears throat> I've been blown away that uh, when I read uh, Rethink X, and I've been wanting to ask this for a while, uh, what is the role that data is playing in rethinking humanity? So the conclusion of rethinking humanity, um, after looking at 10,000 years of societal disruptions, as well as sector disruptions, is that we're on the cusp of the fastest, biggest, deepest transformation of civilization in history. Um, during the 2020s, um, what I call the five foundational sectors of the economy, information, energy, transportation, food, and materials, all of them will be disrupted in the 2020s because we're going to have a deep, perfect uh, convergence of many technologies that 
are going to make this possible. Um, so, but it's not just about, this is not just another industrial revolution, if you will. Um, we're not replacing one extractive industry with another. Um, information is at the center of all of these disruptions. And again, information is at the center of all of, of this. Food as software, transportation as a service. Um, you pick the sector and it's being disrupted by information. So information going forward has immense value. Data, user data. And let me talk about user data, for instance. Um, today, our data, um, you know, whether it's uh, usage of cars or music, right? Um, or, or energy or uh, nutrition is essentially being extracted. There are companies out there making a lot of money and health, right? With our information, with our data. And that data has immense value. So we need to rethink as a society going forward, um, the status of that data. And, and I think that we should treat data, for instance, as we treat intellectual property. So every individual has a right to own that data. This is not about privacy, right? This is about ownership so that I can license my data. Everybody, 7 billion people on this planet have the right to license their data to anyone they want or not on any terms that they want or not, right? I mean, it's a business transaction um, so that they can benefit directly from their data that they're generating every single minute of every single day. Um, so again, to your question, information is at the center of essentially all sector disruptions going forward. Uh, Lori, what is one thing which has changed, which is never gonna uh, come back to the way it was before COVID? Well, I think this whole, we don't have to be in the same room to have, um, you know, uh, meaningful dialogue and connection. <laughs> um, having been in consulting a big chunk of my career, um, you know, I've been a road warrior and on, the, on and off the planes and I feel bad for United. <laughs> but, mm. um, you know, I feel happy for my kids that I, I've been able to be home more and um, still have a very, um, you know, robust kind of career and work experience over using technology. I mean, I do miss, I miss mm. seeing people and I do miss going and doing a lot, but um, I've also, I'm kind of a silver lining kind of person. So for me, the silver lining has been more, more time with my family. The uh, traditional workspace, um, what we were used to prior to the, you know, in 2019 um, is a, uh, will be a faint memory for all of us who enjoyed going in the office, you know, going by the cooler, having coffee, regular regiment and routines, um, to now adapting to uh, home work, right? And, and realizing that, you know, now setting up your social experience at home, less interactive, is going to be a very important significance and how we proceed, you know, um, I started in the, the opportunities that were afforded me will now be different, you know, in the social sphere, starting in the music business, actually having to run to radio stations and move artists around and having that one-on-one -on -one in the van driving cross country will be limited because of uh, how we're going to interact. Because now with the advent of Zoom and other social media platforms, you connect with the artists in a social space. You don't necessarily have to deal with them. So from that aspect of business and connectivity, um, those things uh, will morph into something totally different that will change and never be like, like it used to be. Yeah, I think that this what this year um, has shown is how fragile human constructs can be. Um, you know, I, 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 um, we tend to see things as constants when they're actually variable. Um, and we tend to see everything around us as, you know, pretty much timeless, right? Um, isn't this the way life has been 
forever and will always be plus or minus. Um, and what we have seen is how fragile, you know, all those things are, or many of those things are. Um, and, you know, to the point of disruption, right? I mean, we can feel it at a personal level, at a societal level. Um, you know, many years ago, I, for instance, in, in my work, I said that by 2030, um, you know, 80 to 90% of parking spaces are going to be empty, basically freed up because of the disruption of transportation, which is autonomous, electric, and on demand. Um, and I mean, almost, almost consistently, even if folks accepted, saw the disruption of transportation and even invested in it, they found it hard to believe that we're going to stop owning cars within 10 years or 15 years. Um, and that that many, I mean, a third of the landmass of the city um, essentially is going to be freed up within 10 years. And um, one of the things we saw this year is sure enough, that in America, um, essentially 90% of parking spaces were freed up for another reason, right? Because of the COVID disruption, not transportation. But the, even the idea that that was gonna happen a year ago was considered insane. And now it's like, yeah. Yeah, Tony, how does the SABA technology disruption framework apply to data products? Think about this question. Um, why did the smartphone um, launch in 2007? Not 2005 or 2009, right? 2005, um, why 2007? Why was that the year when both Google and Apple come up with uh, a new smartphone? The answer to that is that um, there was a convergence of technologies that made a $600 smartphone possible that year, 2007. Um, 2005 was too early, 2009, by that time this, that, you know, the ship had sailed. Um, now, can you anticipate the 2007 numbers? Can you anticipate that disruption? Um, that's what the SIBA technology disruption framework, um, that's why I've been working on it for 15 years, um, to be able to analyze and predict Right and, and and so that we can lead the disruptions. Wonderful. Uh, I have I have a question, uh, Benny. Benny, I'm going off the of my uh, list of questions for the newer artists and the newer entrepreneurs coming in your space, which is uh, entertainment. Uh, how important is for them to have some understanding of the power of data? Uh, as they become successful either as an artist or as an entrepreneur in the space? Uh, is it, is it as the times are changing, is it a must or it's a good to have? It's a liberating freedom. Um, Pre-COVID, you have to think about the DIY business and music was a $2 billion business um, because of the data, the freedom of artists to now have their careers in their own hands. The data allows you now to go into a micro aspect of marketing and realize like you don't have to um, look at the world as is, is just your marketplace. You can actually realize from the data that your fans are in Dothan, Alabama. And now you can actually put all your resources and you can put all your attention where you actually have fans that, that are being, um, being generated and, uh, and, 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 and impacted. So I think it's important as you move forward, right, that the, uh, the new artist of today and tomorrow is in total control of, of how he or she chooses to be a part of their art, right, and their business because the information is so powerful that never existed before. Um, at labels uh, years back, they controlled the data. So from an artist's perspective, you only got information on a very granular um, uh, uh, situation of, of what you may need to know um, about your career, where now all of the analytics are available for you to, to decide and move forward. Beautiful, that's great. Uh, I have a bunch of questions coming from the audience, but I'm gonna uh, 
do something fun. We're going to just do a, a fun rapid round. Uh, each of you will answer the question in one to five words. Uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the following words? I'll say the word. Let's go one by one. We'll go with Benny and then we'll go Laurie and then we go to Tony, right? Uh, 2021. Game changing. Vaccinations. Between two ages. Vaccination. <laughs> Benny. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hope. Bali. Okay, Benny. Cloud Sufi. Necessary. Nori. Innovative. AI, music, orchestra. Benny, Irfan Khan. <laughs> Superstar. Nori. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing entrepreneur. So you think you can dance? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, last but not the least, uh, there is a set of questions which are coming in and I'll just pick up two. And uh, any one of you can pick up to answer, all of you can answer that too, right? Uh, it says, uh, the first question which is coming is saying, what changes in technology do you see having the most impact in the lifestyle of people? Um, communication. Uh, as as the as the communication um, as things, let me let me repeat. What I see is um, being impactful is in change is communication, and being a part of an ever changing world is going to be important. That we not only just speak, but we are also able to process and receive um, how we communicate now in in a landscape of post COVID, right? And how we communicate in and understand and receive information. Lori. I would say uh, disruptions in healthcare, changes in uh, availability, accessibility of data, the use of that data to improve uh, the delivery of um, healthcare, um, not just in the US, but globally. Tony. Yeah, um, transportation as a service is going to change everything about the way we work and live and, and, and act. Um, precision biology, um, which is a broad set of technologies, is going to essentially change health and food. Uh, there was a question which we had shortlisted, but another one popped up. I'm going to sequence that. That's the last one. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting question. It said, how is the life of elders will change post-COVID? Benny. Wow. Um, of elders, having uh, two elderly parents and um, realizing uh, how fragile the uh, circumstances are um, in seeing them, right? Uh, I believe that it's going to be important for us to find new ways on making sure that they're able to have connectivity, right? So figuring out how we're going to manage that process of aging is going to be imperative, right? So that we, so aging is still graceful, it still has dignity, and that we still can can have the value of, of love and connection. Beautiful, Benny, and in, Lori. Yeah, I agree with Benny. I mean, I have a ninety-year-old mother-in-law, and she actually switched assisted living situations because the one she's in. They just gone mm -hmm. to complete lockdown and delivering meals on trays with so completely socially isolated. So she switched to another facility that allows them to go to the dining hall. <laughs> so I, I totally agree that um, I think our elders can no longer um, sort of uh, turn a blind eye to technology. So many of us have older parents, grandparents, and so on who are not really on social media or don't really know how to use a smartphone. And I just think that that's a tragedy in this situation, right? So we've we've had mm -hmm. to try to find easier ways to make technology accessible to older people who might have a fear factor of adopting technology. But in the absence of being able to have human connection, um, you know, technology is the way to keep families connected, frankly, um, and for them to be able to have a video chat 
uh, with somebody who's not able to get out of the house is, is um, going to be increasingly important. No, oh, that's true. Uh, Tony. Yeah, I think that um, what we've seen this last year is, um, you know, COVID pulled the curtain on the fragility of, um, you know, some of our basic assumptions and institutions and, and beliefs and, and, and so on. Um, and one of them is, um, uh, so going forward, I think that we'll need to rethink everything, um, what it means to be a family, right? What we've done over the last generation or, or two um, and, and what it means to live longer, um, to be healthier uh, or less healthy. So all our institutions and our beliefs, fun, fundamental beliefs uh, that we've held, again, as constants over the last generation or two, um, we know now they're variable and we, we're gonna have to rethink. Rethink our family, uh, family in, in every institution, legal institutions and so on. Um, we owe that to ourselves and we owe that to um, our parents. Absolutely. No, I, 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 would, and I would take an opportunity to answer this question myself because very close to my heart. And as much as I have lost uh, both my parents uh, on in, in, uh, way early, uh, I think, uh, and it, it's very, very close to Cloud Sufi also. In, in, in the next three months, we are coming out with Cloud, Cloud Sufi Foundation. And we really want to bring elders, which we, are, and again, it depends what age group, but 70 to 90 is the age group we are targeting to bring them back to workforce. The, what we are saying is that, and you, you all covered that dimension that uh, even if COVID was not there, uh, the, the reason for physical health or a quality of physical health has got to do with the mental health. And there are so many people I have come across who are in that age bracket, right? And they are totally fine. They're fertile minds. They're like a kid and kid curious to learn everything, except there is this stigma in the society for some reason where they cannot contribute to the cutting edge. And we really want to prove it wrong. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a war footing. It's a war cry for us. We can make it happen in any way or form. So I think it's, uh, it's wonderful. So that, that, uh, uh, it's 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 amazing what this discussion was, and uh, I mean I have goosebumps hearing what all you just said, and uh, I want to thank all of you for your insight, and an incredible uh, thought provoking uh, provoking sessions right now. Uh, this is the end of uh, making data human virtual forum, and we will have multiple such forums as we bring, and uh, I'm so compelled to bring the same team back again, saying uh, let's go to the next level of doing it, and uh, I'm hoping. Uh, it has left you all with a greater understanding or a greater curiosity uh, about uh, the data increasing the role of our lives and industry. And uh, with this, thank you so much uh, again, everyone to uh, join in. And of course, uh, Benny, Laurie and Tony, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, stay healthy. And uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you, you, Benny. Thank you, Irfan. Thank, thank you, you Laurie. Thank you.